Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is in the bosom of the Father, has made him known. We have seen his glory. We testify of his glory to you. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. He displays God to you. He does so with such perfection that when his hour comes and Thomas says to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and that will be good enough for us, Jesus looks at Thomas and says, I have been with you this whole time, Thomas. Don't you recognize me? You want to know what God would say? Listen to Jesus. Jesus tells you what God says. You want to know what God would do? Look at Jesus. Jesus does what God does. I do the works that I see my Father doing, and I do them up until now. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the firstborn of the creation which means he is before everything that is in the creation. Before any human being was, Jesus was there. Before any plant or animal was, Jesus was there. Before there were oceans or land or mountains, Jesus was there. Before there was dirt, Jesus was there. Before there was light, Jesus was there. And before the primordial waters out of which God called the creation, Jesus is there. You get into a time machine and you go backwards in time and no matter how far back you go, you get out of the time machine and Jesus is there. A pre-incarnate Jesus, but Jesus nonetheless. You get back in your time machine, you go back still further, you get out of your time machine and Jesus is still there. And you get back in your time machine and you go back still farther and still farther and you get out of your time machine and Jesus is still there. Jesus is the firstborn of the creation. By him, all things were made. Everything in the creation was made by him, and everything in the creation is made for him. Jesus made the plants and the animals. Jesus made the dog and the cat in your house. Jesus made the beans and the corn that you raise. Jesus made the earth out of which you raise them. Jesus made the whales in the ocean and the lions in the jungle, and he made the algae and the octopi and the squid. Jesus made the duck-billed platypus and the Tasmanian devil. He made them all. Jesus made the trees. Jesus made the grass. Jesus made them all, for all things are made by him, and all things are made for him. Jesus made everything on the earth. Jesus made everything in the seas, and Jesus made everything in the heavens. He made them all. Jesus made the sun and the moon. Jesus made the asteroids and the comets. Jesus made the planets, the galaxies, and the quasars. He made them all. He keeps them all. They are all made for his glory. He is the firstborn of all creation. So, it really ought not to surprise anybody that Jesus changes water into wine. It ought not surprise anybody when Jesus commands the wind and the waves and they obey Him. At least they recognize their Maker when they see Him. It should be no surprise at all that Jesus walks on that water and declares, I am. And mercifully tells us not to be afraid. Jesus is the firstborn of all of the creation. All things are made by Him. All things are made for Him. That includes the things that are visible and the things that are invisible. Jesus made all of the angels. Jesus made the angels of fire. Jesus made the angels with three sets of wings. Jesus made the angels that are covered with eyes. Jesus made the angels and assigns the most powerful ones to the little ones who believe in him. Now it's hard to gauge what Jesus may mean by a little one, but I suspect that it's people under the age of 13. He made your angel and assigned your angel to you. Children, boys and girls. He assigns your angel to you, and your angel is so powerful that it beholds the face of the Father in heaven. Jesus made them all. 
He sends the angels to you, ministering spirits, to take care of you who will inherit salvation. They are made by Him. They are made for Him. Jesus is the firstborn of the creation. He is the maker of all things. He makes all thrones, all rulers, all authorities, all governors, whether in heaven or on earth. So not only does Jesus create the angels, Jesus creates all of the rulers and the governors and the authorities of the earth. We are so accustomed to saying that God permits for God. We're talking about Jesus here, but we're talking about God. We are so accustomed to say that Jesus permits the president to rule that we miss Colossians chapter 1, which says that Jesus creates the presidency and then creates the president who holds the office. Jesus does not just permit the Congress to hold office, he creates the Congress. And then he creates those congressional members to serve in the Congress. Jesus does not permit judges to rule, he creates the court, and then creates the judge who serves in the court. Jesus does not permit dictators to reign, he creates the office of king and then creates the king who serves in the office. He is the maker of all rulers, all governors, all authorities in heaven and on earth. They are made by him and they are made for him. And another thing, we miss the point of Colossians chapter 1 if we sit in the pew and say to ourselves, well, why would Jesus create a bunch of people like these to govern over us? If you are sitting there in the pew thinking that, you are missing the whole point. You are not to stand in judgment upon Jesus as if he would give you a gift that is not for your good or a gift that is not in fulfillment of his word. The issue is not, why would God per or Jesus permit a president like this one? It's my land. The president is created by him. We need to warn him. We need to warn the Congress and warn the legislature they are made by him and are responsible to him. Somebody needs to say something to them to warn them. Remind them of who their maker is. <laughs> Too often, we Christians use render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render unto God the things that are God as an excuse for dealing with the government without taking God into consideration. As if when God demands the things that be rendered unto him as being different from the things being rendered unto Caesar, that somehow he didn't make Caesar. Well, he did make Caesar. And he expects certain things from Caesar. The maintenance of order in society by the punishment of the wrongdoer. And so God bestows upon the state the authority to tax, the authority to enforce laws, prison sentences, fines, jails, police officers, armies, and so forth. It is not the church's job to maintain order in society, although we help in that regard. He is the maker of all authorities. He is the maker of all rulers. He is the maker and governor of all things, and in him all things hold together. Which means he made gravity, right? Gravity holds things together. He made those subatomic forces that hold the subatomic particles together so that you and I have atoms and molecules that make up our bodies in such a way that they function. And he created the forces between the atoms and the molecules to enable you to sit on those pews. Otherwise, you just, your molecules uh, would just fall through the molecules of the pew you're sitting on. Or actually, your atoms would fall through the atoms of the pew you're sitting on. But because of the forces that bind them together, the pulpit holds me up and your pews hold you up and the whole universe hangs together. When I leave a book somewhere, I leave it and I come back to it, unless one of you have moved it, that book is still there. It's not in Maryland or North Dakota or someplace. Which is why my mother would always ask me when I lost something, well, where have you left it? Annoying question if you ask me, but in him all things hold together. So unless somebody has moved whatever it is that I have left, whatever it is I have left ought to still be there when I find it. He holds all things together, you understand. Those subatomic forces don't even make sense to physicists. That's because we're so used to gravity. And what is gravity anyway? Can you see it? It's the warping of space-time. Why should a large object warp space-time more than a small object? 
I don't know, but I'm sure glad this warping of space-time occurs and keeps me on the terra firma and not floating away into space where I die somewhere. Keeps me, keeps the atmosphere on the earth. I'm really glad it's there. Thank Jesus it's there, for he made all things. All things are made by him, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the same. Now, heads direct the functions of the body. There are the autonomic functions that our brains perform without us even having to pay attention to them in order for them to work. For example, I do not often pay attention to the fact that my heart is beating, but my brain keeps the heart beating, and that keeps me alive, and I'm really glad my brain does that. And then there are the things that my head does of which I am aware, like walking, eating, enjoying a good joke, watching something on TV, reading a good book, listening to the Word of God. And you, you can go on and on with all of the different activities that the head coordinates for your body. All of the athletics that are performed because the head has figured out how to coordinate the body in a certain skilled fashion. In the same way, Jesus is the head of the church. He coordinates all of her activities. There are things that Jesus does for the church of which we are unaware. He maintains all kinds of things for the maintenance of our congregation of which we are unaware. We're so unaware of it that we don't even give thanks for it. And yet he maintains those things for our benefit. And then there are those things that Jesus coordinates within the church of which we are aware. He gives us His Word. He gives us His Word to receive for ourselves, to administer to each other, and to our neighbors in accord with our vocations. He gives us His baptism that we receive for ourselves and bestow upon others in accord with our vocations. He gives us His body and His blood for our management and for our administration on earth and gives us the instructions on how those things are to be managed on earth. These are the things that he does. He is the head of the body. And just like a body without a head is dead, without Jesus, the church would be dead. Frankly, without Jesus, the church wouldn't be the church at all. But with Jesus, you are the church. And with Jesus, you are alive. And with Jesus, you are alive in the same way that he is alive, eternally. Jesus is the head of the church. He has given you, the church, the vocation of bringing the kingdom of heaven onto the earth, of announcing the forgiveness of sins and that the reign of heaven has come in Jesus Christ. His kingdom is not of this world. You have the responsibility, the privilege, and the power and authority to bestow everlasting life upon others when the announcement of the gospel comes from your lips. And so you bestow forgiveness and everlasting life in the name of Jesus Christ upon others. You are the body of Christ. And just as Jesus went about healing and preaching and casting out demons and raising the dead, so also you do these things. And you will do even greater things than Jesus according to his promise. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the firstborn of the dead. One of these candles fell down. And if I keep preaching to you with a candle on my foot, there's going to be a problem. Okay, now where was I? Oh yes! Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. He is the firstborn of the dead. He's the first one to come out of that tomb and stay that way. Do you understand what a fundamental change in the universe this is? Do you understand the alteration of the universe that you and I have brought into it by our sins? One of the things our sins do is bring disorder into the universe. Think of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods. When you have another god, you are disrupting the fundamental principle of the universe. There's one God, the maker of all that is. When you turn to another God, you are disrupting that fundamental relationship between the creation and its God. And when you disrupt that, you disconnect it from life, and everything starts dying then. 
We have introduced death into the universe, not just on ourselves. We brought it on everything. Everything dies. Holy smokes. And all of the other commandments, when you don't honor your father and mother, there's disorder in the family. When there's murder, there's disorder in the victim's family and in the murderer's family. When adultery is committed, there's disorder. Somebody new is introduced into the family that doesn't belong there. When there is stealing, there is disorder. Talk to anybody who's been robbed about the disorder of being stolen from. When somebody lies about you, there's disorder. Think of it. When you go to school and somebody's telling a lie about you, the lie goes around school. There's disorder in your life as all of your relationships change because of the disorder introduced by a falsehood. And then that disorder manifests itself in our lives. Physicists call it the second law of thermodynamics. They also call it entropy. I've talked about this before. Uh, did you know that if you put your house in order and then leave it for a year or two, your house will naturally go on its own from a state of order to a state of disorder. Believe it or not, I, I mean, some of us, myself included, should take great comfort in this. <laughs> All right? It will by itself go from a state of order to a state of disorder. Your car goes from a state of order to a state of disorder. That's why you got to clean the house and repair the house. That's why you have to change the oil in the car and perform routine maintenance. That's why sometimes you have to have the car fixed. We have introduced disorder into the universe and it affects everything. Our bodies are born in a state of order. And not all of our bodies even. But many of our blessed bodies that were born in a state of order. And then as we age, you know how it is, it gradually moves into a state of disorder. And the final disorder of it all is death. And all of the universe does this. Plants and the animals die. Mountains die. Stars die. It seems like everything dies. We have introduced this into the universe. Now understand what Jesus is doing when he rises from the dead. He is altering the fundamental nature of the universe. He is saying it is not going to be this way anymore. We are now going to go from a state of disorder to a state of order. And so the muscles of Jesus are in that tomb and they become supple again and strong. The blood of Jesus that he lost is restored to him and it flows. The breathing of Jesus that had ceased resumes. Jesus is deaf in the tomb, he resumes hearing. Jesus is blind in the tomb, he resumes seeing. Death is reversed. And all of the decay associated with death is reversed with it. You, as the body of Christ, therefore become the agents of introducing this restoration into the creation. Which is why the church has always had healing ministries. The church has always had ministries of mercy. As we seek to restore the order that God has given us by the power of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. He is the firstborn from the dead. And he promises your ultimate reconciliation. He has reconciled all things in heaven and on earth unto himself. Here's what that means. That means that Jesus made all things and all things are made for him. We have introduced sin into the world and we have introduced disorder into the world. By doing so, we have incurred the wrath of Jesus. And yes, people, Jesus has wrath. Make no mistake about it. Read the Gospels again and make sure you know that Jesus has wrath. And so what Jesus does is he reconciles not only us to him, but all of the creation to him by taking his, our disorder onto himself. And he becomes as disordered as you can get. He is crucified. He takes it all away. And when he takes it all away, there's nothing left for him to be mad at us. His wrath is gone. We are reconciled to him. And not only are we reconciled to him, all of the creation is reconciled to him. And not only are we reconciled to him, we're reconciled to each other, which is what the sharing of peace means. And we are reconciled to the creation. All of it. This is what Jesus does. This is who Jesus is. In him you have redemption, the forgiveness of all of your sins. In him... 
God has transferred you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the Son of His love. All the fullness of the deity Himself dwells bodily in Him. In the name of Jesus. Amen.